Hello, everyone, and welcome to Swedish Game Conference lunch talk with Rob from Arrowhead. Give him a big applaud. Yay. Wow, awesome. Hi. Um, I guess you can all hear me okay, right? Yes, great, sweet. Okay, um, yeah, as I said, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm the one of the art directors at uh, Arrowhead here in Stockholm. Um, we have two, we have one art director which has been the art director for Helldivers and I've been the art director for the Gauntlet project which got released uh, last September. Uh, and I'm sort of here just to kind of talk to you guys or just chat to you guys a little bit about visual effects and something that is kind of annoying me a little bit in terms of the fact that there's like, there's no visual effects artists in video games and it's really annoying from a perspective of like wanting to hire effects artists because you're like we desperately need an effects artist and there aren't any um, and uh, I wanted to just sort of like briefly just chat and talk to you guys about you know what's involved why it's awesome stuff like that and yeah you may be sort of like wondering okay well you're like an art director so I guess you do arty stuff um, like why why am I particularly interested in visual effects um, so these are the, I'm surprised how many I actually have, but these are the games that I've worked on so far. Um, all of them, apart from Killzone 2, I've done effects for. Um, Gauntlet's been a bit more, yeah, art directory stuff, uh, as well as UI design and scripting and other bits and pieces, kind of been crazy. So, yeah, I sort of, I've been doing effects for, I guess, like seven, eight years now, and it's sort of one of those things that you kind of, or most people seem to like accidentally get into. It's not a thing that people kind of go like, come out of university or study and go like, hey, I'm gonna be an effects artist in games. This is totally like the path I'm going in. Everybody seems to go for like character artist, um, uh, environment artist, that sort of thing. And I wanted to sort of like just have a chat and sort of raise the awareness that it is actually uh, a discipline that people can go into and it's a really, really cool thing to do. Um, can I get a show of hands, like how many of you people are artists or want to be artists going in that direction? Okay, how many out of all of you have considered going into visual effects as like a discipline? Okay, that's cool. That was more than I was expecting, even though it's like five, so. Um, sweet, yeah, so yeah, visual effects are really, really awesome. Um, I'm gonna show you some videos. Um, Okay, so I don't know if it's a spoiler or anything like this, but I think Final Fantasy has been one of those amazing things which they've always just like pushed stuff forward in terms of visual effects. And every time I kind of look at the stuff that they're doing, it's just like, oh my God, this is just so amazingly awesome stuff. And I always get amazed that I'm like, people don't seem to want to do it or are a bit afraid of doing it. And so, yeah, you get to create like all of the awesome stuff that's going on. If you imagine this without all of the lightning and the dust and then like this sequence, which you may have seen before, like not having effects in here when everything starts really, really kicking off. Like what have you got? You've kind of got nothing there. You're adding like all the, the amazing, super awesome part to the game. And um, yeah, it's so much fun. Just like doing stuff like this, it's just so much fun. And I think people should do it. Um, so that's sort of like a, a kind of goal for for things to do, and uh, Final Fantasy has always been something that I've kind of like looked at as a uh, sort of like point of reference when kind of working on effects stuff. Um, so yeah, you get to do all the awesome magic-y stuff. So you get to do all the little sparkly things and all this like swirly stuff and cool spells and shit like that. And that's that's always really awesome. You also get to do um, like atmospheric stuff, uh, and that's another thing that I have another video for you. Um, I think Killzone is pretty awesome in terms of like a lot of the stuff they do. But again, like looking at sort of like the snow and like everything that's happening at the moment, the effects are adding so much to the world and to the experience that the player is having. You get a really nice, a really awesome sort of like hostile feel from the environment. You feel really, you, can, you get a real sense of what it would actually be like to be there in that situation. And again, if you remove the effects from this, you're, it's, you're, yeah, okay, it's snowy, it's sort of cold, but you're not getting that really like in your face, like uh, sort of dusty snow that gets blown up and 
And that really sort of anti-human kind of feeling that the environment's giving off. And it's adding that extra part is just, it's so much fun just working on that sort of stuff and just bringing up the, the quality and the atmosphere of the game. Um, yeah, I mean, gameplay is another really awesome part of doing visual effects. It's, you kind of, you spend a lot of time sort of really em emphasizing what's happening in games. And a lot of part of visual effects ends up being like, you're adding sort of like the punch and the impact of stuff. You're kind of, you're, you're rewarding players for doing really, really awesomely, uh, for doing really, really cool stuff in the game, for saying like, hey, you've done an awesome job, or like, hey, you just shot that guy in the face, that was great, you know, like, way to go. Um, and I think a really good example of sort of like rewarding sort of gameplay sort of stuff, um, where do I have it? Um, I think Hearthstone is a really, really good example of like, you're essentially doing sort of mundane stuff, but with the use of really good UI and really good effects, it's just made so awesome. Like the kind of the glow that you get before you put the pack on the thing and before you open it saying like, oh, you're about to do something incredible. This is gonna be amazing. Are you ready for it? And placing it down and having the thing explode and having all this like light and sparklies and stuff like that is really just sort of saying, like rewarding you for actually engaging in the game and, and, and doing something that essentially is kind of mundane Dane, if you took away all of the fancy like guff that goes with it, right? Uh, and yeah, I, adding that ten percent is is one thing that I think is really, really important, and something to even bear in mind when it comes to like smaller games. It's often overlooked as like a effects are often overlooked or done as sort of like a last minute thing, and I think that when you have a really good lighting and really really good effects in a game, you can actually bring the quality of the entire thing up a hell of a lot, and it's that last sort of like 10, 20% that goes into making games that really delivers the, just brings the whole thing up to a, to a level of quality that is better than if you just kind of like rushed something out. And I think it's worth spending the, the time to do that and being the person that comes in and adds all the extra sparkly goodness and all the atmospheric stuff, you are the person that kind of brings the quality of, of everything up. Uh, and juice is a word that I like to use quite a lot, and that is sort of similar to the Hearthstone thing. That is that, like, the juicy goodness of, like, oh, it feels so awesome to click this thing or do this thing or shoot that guy or, like, destroy things. You get to add that, like, that really, really fun, juicy goodness. Um, and I started thinking, like, okay, well, maybe it's, why is it something that people don't really try? And it's, it is a little bit intimidating, I think. It's a little bit of a weird thing to get into. Like, interfaces and stuff, I think, yeah tend to be a little bit overwhelming. There's like buttons everywhere. None of them are particularly kind of that intuitive. And I think anyone coming from like a, oh, I'll just try this out perspective kind of can get a little bit scared just sort of like looking at that. Like there's the, the middle one is like the popcorn effects. You can actually script, um, actually do coding in there for how particles behave. So this is, I think it's a little bit scary for sort of, you know, I put artist in like quotes, but someone who's a little bit afraid of getting into numbers and code and, and stuff like that. It, yeah, it is a bit scary. And a lot of what you're doing is, like a lot of the numbers and stuff that you're working with tend to be things like you're setting sizes and speeds and, and sort of changing colors and how that sort of changes over time. And you do, you do sort of dabble and it helps to kind of get into shader stuff, but like, Essentially, it's, it's not that scary, and it's one of those things that I think people, if they break through that kind of barrier of not really knowing what's there or what they're doing or not really um, feeling a little bit intimidated by it, I think if you break through that barrier, actually, you, you get into something that's really, really fun. Um, there's hardly anything out there, it feels, in terms of like good tutorials, good information, stuff like that. So you're often kind of on your own trying to figure how stuff works. And there is a lot of time I think gets spent just like, how am I gonna make this work? Or pulling apart an effect that, or, or something that you see in real life and pulling it apart and making it work in a video game. And that, that I think can be a little bit scary. And like I was saying, effects often happens as like an afterthought. So people go like, oh shit, we need to, we need to put some effects in here. And maybe you take, especially in a smaller studio, maybe you, one of the artists um, was the guy who said like, oh, maybe I can do some effects, I've got to spare like two hours, and they just rush out a load of fire and smoke and, and stuff like that. Um, and so yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's something that no one really, really gets into. That's my interfaces. Um, yeah, so what do you do? 
you, the vast majority of the work that you do is sort of like particle effect stuff. So that's um, generally using sort of meshes and like billboard sprites to recreate real world or uh, fantastical effects. Um, sort of painting 2D textures, things like that, making them move, making them change over, over time. And that tends to be like the bulk of the work that you get, get involved in. But you also get to do really, really cool stuff like screen effects. That's something that you know, effects artists get to play with quite a bit. Um, and so by screen effects, I mean like things like you get like blood and stuff like that appearing on the screen. If you get shot, you have like really awesome things like dust and sort of the really nice artifacts that you get on lenses um, and that sort of stuff. And you also get to do really cool things like this. You get to do weird like drug-induced trippy shit with weird colors and distortion and weird things. And like, who doesn't want to make this happen? Like, this is fun. It's like, it's, it's crazy and bonkers and great. And you get to be the person that creates the sequence. And granted, it's kind of absurd that he's in his underpants skydiving. Um, I never actually played this part of GTA V, but it's some trip that you go on and you end up being abducted by aliens and get thrown out of a out of a spaceship and yeah, it's all kind of crazy. And this stuff, like without effects, yeah, it's a bit weird, but like you, you add all of that awesome kind of like crazy fun stuff that happens there. And that's, you know, that's your job. You get to do that stuff. That's pretty, pretty freaking awesome. Um, in terms of like, I say like material effects I have down there, that is another thing, like things like people who are there, they've got like fire coursing through their veins or Maybe they pick up some sort of disease and you can see the disease spreading like across their body. Um, there's other really cool things um, in terms of what I class under like material effects as for example, this from Silent Hill 3, which is really, really awesome. Um, I still can't fully figure out how they did this and that excites me quite a bit. Um, but this sort of stuff, like really weird ass blood stuff moving across surfaces and corrupting you. And it, this, I think, is one of the most awesome things ever, actually. That happened in video games, I think, is really cool from an effects artist perspective. Um, so, yeah, you get to do this kind of crazy, crazy awesome stuff as well. Uh, it goes on for a little while, but yeah, it comes out of the sink, and then you can see she gets covered in it, and then the whole room turns into blood, and it's, it's pretty nasty. But it's also really, really awesome at the same time. Okay, so what makes good particle effects? What I think makes good particle effects? Um, good sprites is an important thing. There's a lot of times, this is one of the awesome and annoying things when you end up sort of, once you've worked in games for a little while and then you, you start pulling apart like what everybody's doing and looking at other games and going like, oh wow, that's really crap or they did that really badly. And effects tends to be one of those things where people kind of don't do things that great. Uh, good sprites is something that's important. So working into textures really nicely, making sure that, say, if you've got like a, like a smoke column from a fire or something like that, making sure that because you're limited to using you know, just a few sort of like textures on screen, you need to, say you've got like a smoke thing and you've got um, like five, ten sort of large billboards of sort of smoke, you need to make sure that they don't, they're using the same texture, they may be different colored over time, but you need to make sure that they don't look like they are the same texture, so they need to be sort of like sufficiently generic enough, but interesting enough and representing what you're trying to do in a good enough way that you can sell the illusion that just these five quads that have a painting of smoke on them actually is a, a realistic smokestack, something that's sort of flowing and working. And there's a lot of problem with like getting alphas really right, getting sort of like certain really, there's sort of like sometimes you get really high contrast in certain sprites that, that stand out and you can see like the same four pixels again and again and again, but they might be rotated, but you, the illusion starts breaking if you don't have um, really nice textures on your sprites. Uh, good movement is another thing that I really believe in. It's, it's again, like taking the sort of smoke uh, column example, having the smoke, the things need to rotate, they need to move in a way, they need to move in a speed and a rotation that, that works that actually behaves like smoke would behave, or like fire would behave, or something like that. And looping that into enhancing gameplay, if you're doing effects that are, that need to have sort of a certain punch, a certain impact on them, getting movement right and how they react and how they work within the gameplay and how that, that sort of stuff goes is extremely important. And I think 
that is again something that can fall down a little bit, that people don't really um, spend too much time thinking about how things move, how things react. Um, there was a, I think there was a contesting on polycount recently with um, doing some effect stuff for, for Riot. And I had a little look at some of the videos there, trying to see if there was anything that I wanted to take. And I think a lot of the problem, some of them looked absolutely amazing. But I think a lot of the problem that I saw repeatedly was that like good movement was a bit of an issue because they were really nice and smooth and they flowed really great, but they lacked that real impact that you want. If you're throwing a fireball at someone, you want to have a real sort of like smash kind of hit impact. And there's a lot of tendency, and I'm like have been very guilty of, of doing this in the past, and I've actually received this as feedback on myself, is that you kind of want to you want to do things a little bit slower with effects so that you can sort of show off how really nice it is that you've got this flowy thing or how beautiful your little sparks are and how they're working. But a lot of the time when you have something with a really high impact, it's only there for a split second and things move extremely fast. Like sometimes you're, I'm cranking up numbers in, in effects going like, well, this is, this is an insanely high number that this should be moving at. But to get that real punch, you actually... You need to be mindful of this stuff, of, of how things move. Um, and that sort of links into like, enhancing gameplay and, and, and that sort of thing. I think something that's a real nice combination of um, effects and gameplay stuff, doo -doo -doo -doo. looking at Wind Waker as an example of like combat stuff, I think this is a really, really great example of um, combination of a really nice sort of animation pause and the frame pause that you get when you actually hit something. There's a real nice sort of smash impact. And using effects as well in there, you get that real nice kind of like sort of pow, pow, pow sort of hit when you're actually hitting stuff. And it feels really, really awesome to hit bad guys. And that is working with movement, working with, with, um, with gameplay and really sort of like enhancing gameplay. I think it's a little bit in a second where he does more fighting. And that's, yeah, it's, it just adds so much to... To, um, to the game if you make sure that you do this well. Um, yes, and yeah, rewarding the player is kind of the number one thing if you're working in games, uh, in gameplay stuff, just making sure the player feels really, really kind of awesome for doing the thing that they're doing. Uh, right, so, oh wow, I'm running out of time a little bit. Shit, um, why it's great. So yeah, like I said before, you're, you're adding the polish, you're adding the extra like, sort of 10, 20%, you get to be the guy that kind of comes in and along with the lighting guy takes what everyone else has done and just adds smoke and fire and stuff and everything just becomes like, oh wow, now we have a, a real world or a real game or you know, the combat might be feeling a bit crappy but you start adding blood and sort of impact stuff and you're like, oh wow, now it feels really, really good to sort of like start hitting monsters, that's really cool. And you, you're the person that does that, that's really awesome. Um, this I think is sort of leads into a little bit of what you kind of need to be if you're working with effects, but like you get to work pretty closely with everyone. You don't really get stuck into your little art corner or whatever. You're not really sectioned off from everyone else. You end up working with programmers, you end up working with animators, you end up working with, um, with gameplay as well, with designers, and that's really, really cool because you actually get to be a big part of everything that goes on, and for someone like, I always went into video games from the perspective of like making games, like, I never went in from the perspective of I want to do really good art or anything like that. It was just like, games are awesome. I want to do this as, as, a, as a career. And so that's where I come from. Like, I want to make really awesome games. Whatever I do in a game, it doesn't really matter. Whatever part of it, if I'm, if I'm doing coding, if I'm doing something else, then it's all about making really cool games. And being able to work closely with everyone, even on like a large team, um, for example, like Lionhead, I was working with like programmers for, we did some really cool, like, uh, the Fable the Journey game was like a Kinect game that used like conjured magic and stuff like that. We did cool things like 2D fluid simulations on screen and then they took your input from your hands and kind of made all this stuff and we was working with like a graphics programmer doing that stuff and then getting him to hook that stuff up and then I would take it into, um, we were using Unreal, I would take it into Material Editor and make it like turn into like nebulary kind of sparkly awesome stuff and you get to work with everyone and again that needs gameplay so it needs like punch and stuff like that. And it's really cool, and by working with everyone being a part of everything, you sort of get to see how the game is progressing and you get that real like, nice sense of involvement. Um, creativity, that is something that I think is, is something that's sort of a little bit hidden, perhaps. It's, especially with larger, larger studios, I've seen you can often get in a situation where environment art has 
environment are, are sort of like the poor guys who receive a concept from the concept team and then they just make it in 3D and the art director goes like, oh, okay, well, no, his arms need to be thicker or, you know, you need to do this a bit better. To sometimes a little bit of a scary extent, um, uh, there was an instance on, again, Fable the Journey and where there's a certain part where you, you have like horse care because you have like a horse that you look after and you have to befriend and it's all a bit Molyneux-esque. Um, and what part of it is you, like, you pet the horse and then you, you feed it apples. And they actually did a concept of an apple for an environment artist to make. And I was like, yeah, creativity artists should be able to create stuff. And because effects is sort of a little bit sectioned off because it's a little bit separate, you kind of get to still be pretty creative in what you're doing because people don't really have that much of a, uh, not necessarily an understanding, but like a, um, you know, a, a clear goal. They're like, we well, need it to feel awesome and it's gonna be a fire spell, go ahead. And you can be like, oh, I'm gonna have swirly things, I'm gonna have sparky things. Like, you get to be a lot more creative what you're doing. Sparkles is a big thing. There's something I think inherently primeval built into all of us that really enjoys like sparkly things and glittery things and things that shine and, and glow and you get to spend your day doing that and so it feels kind of awesome to just sit there like looking at sparkly things all day going like oh this is great um, and you have an obvious impact so it goes in like, with like the adding polish stuff you actually when you come on board and you start doing effect stuff you lift the quality of everything up a lot and it's kind of nice to have that sort of impact you don't just make a little prop that exists in the world you're like you do something that everyone sees and they're like, hey, nice job, that's really awesome. You did some really, really cool, cool effect stuff there. Way to go. Uh, what sucks? I feel sorry, Emil, for putting game designers on this slide. <laughs> Didn't realize you'd be watching this. Um, I'll start at performance. Um, performance is your, your enemy, basically. Um, to do anything really, really well, you need like a lot of sprites, a lot of stuff, a lot of really um, interesting, deep, kind of complex-ish shaders, and you are pretty much, along with lighting at times, you are pretty much the guy that causes all of the slowdown in your game, and that is something that really, really does suck, because you'll spend ages working on something that's really, really nice, and then you have to really cut it back, and you have to remove all the nice details and stuff like that. Overdraw is your, your enemy, and the thing that will come back to bite you a lot. Having a lot of a lot of billboard sprites on screen, a lot of alpha overlaying stuff, it just gets expensive and you have to be mindful of that when you're working on the effects. But at the same time, even though you're doing that, it comes back with like, oh, well, we've got, you know, 30 instances of this fire effect going on now that's been used in a way that you didn't anticipate and now it's costing a hell of a lot to render it. Yeah, game designers. Um, I put this down because if, when you're often working closely with designers in terms of adding that reward and the game, the, the sort of punch and the, the impact of, of playing the game and rewarding the player, there is a tendency I have found for designers to be a little bit kind of changing in how they are thinking about stuff and how they're designing stuff. And like one day we're going in this direction and then maybe another day we're going in this direction and maybe both of those directions were wrong and we're going in a completely other direction. And then after that, you're actually starting going in the first direction again, but maybe slightly to the right a little bit. And often you're adding the effects and you're, you're working in a capacity where you kind of need to follow that trail quite a bit. And it has led me to be quite stressed and a little bit broken. Um, not at Arrowhead, I have to say that, not at Arrowhead. Although it may be a smidgen. Um, but at Lionhead, I, I, I kind of lost my shit a little bit at a certain points because that was just like, stuff was just changing all the time and you can't spend the time working on something that's really cool because you're like, okay, awesome, magic's gonna work like this, great, now I can work into this. Oh no, we've, we've changed how magic's gonna work, we're gonna do it this way now and it's, uh, that can get a bit grindy, but it, because you are adding that awesomeness to, to the gameplay, it's like you kind of take those hits a little bit. Limitation-wise, yeah, that's, that's something that's a big issue. You, you're still working with pretty old kind of methods. People are still using things like flipbook textures, so rendering off a series of frames from maybe like another, like a fluid simulation package or something like that, or even real-world footage, rendering off like several frames and then just playing them back on the same sprite to kind of like give movement and momentum. There's a few bits and pieces of advancements of how people are doing that, but you're still scrolling textures along meshes and you're still using flipbooks and just painting sprites and stuff like that. It hasn't really evolved that much. It's getting there, but 
you do often get faced with like, oh, I just can't do this because the engine doesn't let me do this. And like I said before, it's still pretty new. So it's getting there bit by bit, but in terms of like resources for stuff that you're looking at, I've often looked for tutorials or just, you know, someone else surely has tried to make this effect before and shared it on, maybe I should do that. Just realized, so like looking for, for inspiration or for, for a tutorial on doing a certain kind of effect. And there are certain ones that come up again and again, and there doesn't seem to be that much available for you to learn from. Um, Maybe I should start doing some sort of like effects tutorials or something, because I'm sure there must be other people searching for this stuff and also not finding it. Um, what else do I have next? Yes, OK, I probably need to go a bit quicker now. So good effects artist, you need to be kind of technically minded. The better ones, I would say, are technically minded. You, it's really great if you get into doing shader stuff, if you kind of enjoy that kind of thing. Um, Having said that, with more like node-based creation of shaders in engines, you can still now kind of just play around and muck around and come up with something that's really, really cool. You need to love and enjoy animation, and that goes back to me talking about like good movement. You've got to really enjoy like how things, the, the feeling of weight and stuff, of impact, of punch, of all of that stuff. You, it's really helpful if you have good 2D skills because you're going to need to be painting stylized sort of textures. You need to have a good appreciation, understanding of like silhouette and how shapes work, how shapes are going to work and move in, in motion as well. Uh, and yeah, making sure that you can pick out parts of, of, of sprites that are, that are looking particularly bad in your smokestack or whatever. You need to be kind of mad and a creative thinker. You need to kind of do weird shit and use the engine in ways that maybe it wasn't intended to be used. Um, there was a thing in Fable 3 where... Um, if any of you played it, there's a section where there's like black gloop kind of like coming off of the floor and there's like goo running down walls and stuff. And the Fable 3 engine did not have the ability to do scrolling textures on anything. And we were like pleading with the engine team, like, come on, we need scrolling textures. We're going to do these goo waterfalls. Come on, we need it. And they just didn't have time for it. And at some point, I was like mucking around with the, the effects editor, which was completely shit, but I was mucking around with it. And it couldn't either do, it couldn't do flipbook textures either. It had the functionality to do it, but it didn't work. And I actually found that if you set the right settings, your, the flipbook texture, instead of like jumping ahead set in the UVs to go to the next um, frame of your animation, it actually just scrolled. So if I set up the texture right and I set up the numbers right, I actually got scrolling textures on stuff. So I used a bug in the engine to do scrolling textures on the goo stuff, and I was pleading with the engine team, like, don't fix this bug, because, you know, otherwise the whole illusion of this is just going to break. So, like, I'm happy with this bug. We can leave it for now. We just ship it, and it'll be fine. Um, another sort of example that I heard uh, GDC this year at one of the roundtables was, you know, the, um, you know, you get, like, a, like, wheel spin and stuff like that in racing games, for example, and this was from Forza. You get a really nice motion blurred kind of like spinning of wheels in racing games that gives that kind of nice feeling of impact. They, they use particles for doing that. So they have like a blurry, spinny particle that they just play on the wheels to give the illusion that the wheels are spinning. It's like, oh shit, I thought there was actual like real motion blur being worked out. They're like, no, it's just a sprite that spins. <laughs> like, ah, this is awesome. You have to, so it's this kind of like crazy, slightly weird stuff that you have to do. And yeah, insanity obviously works in, in hand in hand with that. Um, you often just sit there in front of the computer just like clicking play and going like boom, boom, boom. And then like tweaking some numbers like shh, boom. Shh, and you're like, oh, I need to get that right. And if you actually get to a situation where you're working with other effects artists, you often just communicate stuff in terms of sounds. So you're like, oh, I need something that goes like and like, And if you work with another effects artist, they're like, gotcha, I know exactly what you mean. And they'll do something that has this like shimmer that spins and goes like wing at the end. And you communicate with just noises, and that's, that's kind of fun. You've got to be able to be OK with that, I think, to actually work into it. And yeah, because you're working a lot to do with gameplay stuff, you've got to really enjoy gameplay. You can't just be on your own going like, oh, I want to make really cool effects. You need to think like, you know, you, want to, you need to want to make the game better, and therefore that's going to make your effects stuff a hell of a lot better. Um, right, yes. So if you're interested in effects stuff, uh, there's a Facebook group called Real Time VFX. It's sort of like a, sort of like a support group. It feels um, because there are hardly any effects artists around. It's actually nice. People share stuff on there. Um, you can ask to join, and then people are just like add you onto it. It's really really cool, and there's a lot of re like reference and stuff in there. 
I recommend looking at the VFX talk that um, the guys from Diablo 3 did back in 2013 at GDC. That was really cool. They did some really nice stuff. I'm a little bit, I don't know. I, they do really pretty effects, but I feel that their effects are a little bit kind of messy and um, there's a bit, a bit hard to understand when there's a lot of stuff going on. So I'm like, eh, yay, but also nay on that. Um, there was a series of videos on Unreal Engine 4 visual effects. They were done by GameSpot, which I thought was kind of strange. But at one point they talk about, I think it's the fourth video, how they do this really cool explosion in the Infiltrator demo. And it's like, oh, we rendered this off and then we did it on sprites. And it was really fascinating stuff. So that's cool to watch. There was a talk by the Uncharted guys on visual effects. That was really, really cool. They talk about like doing how they do like um, footprints in the sand and how they spread and move. And that's some really cool stuff in there. Um, the guy, Drew Skillman, he's the guy who holds the round tables at GDC um, on VFX. He's sort of like the ex double fine effects artist, but he puts up all the notes from the round tables. Round tables at GDC aren't recorded because they're basically a group of like 30 people in a room chatting about stuff. Um, so he puts all the notes that he has from the, the GDC round tables up on his website. So check that if you want to see what happens in there. And yeah, if you ever get the chance to go to GDC, I totally recommend going to the VFX round tables because then you get to find out the nuggets of information like wheel spin on cars being sprites or you just get to learn kind of stuff from other people. And I think there are some of the best round tables actually at GDC. So yes, that is the end of my talk. That is all of that. Um, that's my email. That's my Twitter thing. I hardly ever use Twitter. So you're welcome to follow me, but it's, it's often just ramblings and nonsensical stuff. And it happens every month or two. And I'm like, oh, this tool is really annoying. And I just hope that someone shares my anger. Um, <laughs> If you are an effects artist, uh, brackets and UI artists as well, we're, we would like to see stuff from you. That would be really cool because, like I say, I started at, I started at Lionhead as an effects artist, but ended up sort of doing all other things as well. So my time between effects and UI and art direction and stuff is kind of split all over the place. I'm also building tools and stuff as well. So um, getting a, a dedicated VFX artist and or combined whatever UI artist, shadery, techie person. We are, we're on the lookout for someone like that. So send me an email if you think that you fit, send off work. Um, if you have any questions in terms of like what to study, where to go, what to look at, um, yeah, just send me an email and I'll do my best to reply. I can be pretty busy, but I'll try and get back to you people as best I can. Cool, so okay, I'm gonna ask again, like show of hands, how many people are now interested in doing effects? Yes, awesome, cool. That's uh, like more than more than double, so that's great. Awesome, cool. Because if none of you put your hands up, I'd be like, hang on a moment, we had five people before and now we have no people? <laughs> like I've completely done the opposite of what I intended to do, so shit. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys, for listening to me ramble for like the last like 40 minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions for me? I don't know how this works in terms of like being able to hear you, so this could be interesting. You might have to shout. Yes. Um, I'm going to have to take this through a sort of weird, not so good at Swedish translation sort of system trying to answer you. Um, was the question sort of like using code in order to create visual effects and that sort of thing as well, instead of just doing like using tools and stuff like that? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, totally. I think there's, there's a really nice big shift in terms of how stuff's going at the moment with art in terms of like doing stuff procedurally, um, building stuff in a really nice, um, more of a code kind of way. And I think as long as the people working with uh, the code in order to actually create the effects are mindful of how it should look and, and aren't just, I'm gonna say coders, um, aren't just like focused on making a really efficient system, actually are interested in how something looks, I think taking it from a code perspective can actually result in some really, really awesome, weird stuff that you would never be able to do from, uh, from using sort of like the standard tools perspective. So I definitely think code is another, perhaps becoming slightly even more creative way of actually working into effects because you can, when you're deeper down, you can just yeah. muck around. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's that's sort of where the, the techie sort of side of that comes in. I mean, with with things like Unreal and, and other engines where you can actually sort of take the, the, the input from the, the screen buffer and then just muck around with it, you can node-based sort of systems allow you to essentially do what a coder would be doing anyway to, to muck around with the screen. So when you're sitting there plugging in nodes, essentially you're building shader code and so yeah, you could easily just sit in like a text editor and work on the shader code to actually change how the how the screen looks. So there's there's sort of two approaches. I sort of took this more from a like artist kind of perspective, I think, in terms of that stuff. But yeah, totally, you can totally take a more like code approach in terms of doing that stuff because you're essentially mucking around with code anyway at, at the end of the day. So. Um, I would say not that much. Um, you're often using um, meshes. Oh, sorry, if people didn't hear, it was more like how much in terms of like 3D modeling are you doing when you're working in, in effects stuff. It is a lot of the time you are spending a lot of time just working with sprites and stuff like that. So that's kind of like the bulk of your work. You start using 3D assets in a bit more of a creative way, I think. So you start doing things like um, the good old scrolling texture thing, but creating sort of spirals and shapes that you want sort of energy to flow along and perhaps you're using meshes from other assets in game to actually kind of get stuff moving in a way that's really nice that you can't really, you can't get like a no, nice long sort of like strand of energy spiraling around something if, you, if you're trying to do that with sprites. You kind of need to do it in a nice way with meshes. So aside from building things like rocks for rock explosions and like... Um, shell casings and stuff like that from weapons, it tends to be a lot more of the sprite-based stuff and, and just general shader work, but you often do need to use meshes as a, as a base for you to actually work with, with your effects, and combining that with sprites and other stuff, I think, really pushes the quality of stuff forwards. Um, but yeah, in terms of like actual proper 3D asset creation, not so much, I'd say. Anyone else? You. I don't get to look at that many, so I'm still kind of figuring this out a little bit. Um, I would say I would like to... We had a bit of a discussion this actually at, at GDC uh, in terms of what we'd like to see. I think I would prefer to see stuff that's more, more kind of stylized and more gameplay-related effects work because that really shows that someone is mindful of like the, the clarity of the effect that they're doing, of, of the readability of stuff. Um, and it shows that they're good at creating, creating 2D and 3D sort of assets that work with effects with the aim of enhancing gameplay. And at the same time, more gameplay and, and um, perhaps even sort of like magic effects, things that are more like to do with attacking, impact, stuff like that you can see a lot easier, I think, there, the punch and the impact of stuff and the movement and how, how good that feels. I think it's definitely nice to also sort of mix that up a little bit with trying to recreate real world stuff. So actually um, taking footage of stuff blowing up um, really, really cool, like fire and maybe like an oil fire or something like that because that gets really nice sort of like movement and stuff. Trying to recreate something in real world is is can sort of show the two aspects, I think. Seeing both sides is really, really good because a knowledge and an understanding of seeing how something in the real world moves and how that you replicate that with really basic stuff and at the same time seeing understanding for sort of like impact and punch and kind of rewarding people in terms of gameplay stuff. I, I sort of can say both of those because it's, it's again, it's like movement and, and sort of 2D skills and, and that sort of stuff that this, I think is really, really important in a, in a showroom. Anyone else? Oh god, there's two people. I think your hand went up first. How was working with the Fable series and Peter Molyneux? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was the story I was going to tell you. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, as part of the stuff you get to do as an effects artist. Um, I was responsible for the vomit effects in um, Fable 3, um, which actually became a really high priority for, I think, one of the 
the E3 videos talk things that Molyneux did because he wanted, he wanted to play around and then get drunk and then try and chat up someone and then vomit all over the place. So it came through as like Molyneux's highest priority thing that you need to do is work on this vomit effect. So I think I stay late one evening making like the best vomit I could possibly make so that Molyneux was like super happy with it. Um, working with Lionhead, I, it was really, really awesome. And like I really enjoyed Fable... One and to a large extent as well, Fable Two, and so I was like, I actually got the, I actually went for the interview on my birthday and got the job on my birthday, which was like, hey, birthday present, awesome, um, and it was really, really great working there. Um, there is such a great bunch of like, crazy, insane, weird people, and despite being a reasonably large-ish studio, I mean, say large-ish, there are I think, like 100, 120 people or something like that. It still feels really nice and cozy and friendly, and I. Because being an effects artist, I got to work with like everyone in the studio. I kind of got to befriend everyone and know everyone, and it was really, really nice. And it was a really nice sort of family atmosphere. Uh, Molyneux is an interesting character. Um, I never worked that much like directly with him, um, but he's he's very much like a kind of like older stoner kind of character. You can really tell that he smoked a hell of a lot of weed and <laughs> his brain is in that like, you know, kind of happy, good, sort of weird place. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, my, my opinions on him are just generally like, I feel that he, this is going into completely like personal stuff now or whatever, um, but I feel like he's, He's like an excitable five-year-old, and the problem is he's in charge of running a company and making games and speaking to press and stuff like that. So he, I can see how he gets like really excited about certain things, but the problem is that he has a team of like 100 people that are working on the thing that he last got excited about, and then he'll come in and be like, oh, I saw this really awesome TV show, so we need to do this, and then everything has to sort of change. So he does have a tendency to kind of come in and just be like, okay, change direction, we're going this way now, and that was a bit bit horrible when you're working behind him, but I sort of understand kind of where he's coming from as this like excited kid about like, oh, I'm gonna make awesome games, I totally wanna do this stuff, but he gets a lot of bad shit for that kind of stuff, unfortunately. But Lionhead was awesome. I totally, totally recommend it, actually. And they're a really, really nice bunch of people, and I think they also do things, they do a lot of like internships, and they do a lot of like, um, um, I think they're pretty good at talking with people, actually. If you're looking for like jobs or advice and stuff like that, they're actually pretty good at responding. So they're kind of a nice company, I would say. Now, there was a hand there. Yes? Yeah, have you been uh, working on a lot of fantasy games and some shooters? As yep. a visual effects artist, what do you enjoy the most? Um, I definitely enjoy doing more of the fantastical stuff. I think that's a lot more fun, a lot more creative, and a lot more, it goes more into like the sparkly, magical, like oh, pretty things and stuff, glinting and, and all of that stuff. Um, real world things I'm not as, as excited about. Um, I think this goes for just a general personal preference of I'm not that excited about kind of military shooters, for example, they kind of bore the hell out of me. So. I've been lucky and I've generally gone more for games that are like, I worked on games that are more like fantastical and, and magical and stuff like that. And working with like fire and explosions and stuff in that fantastical sense is really, really cool. And I definitely say that's far more what I prefer doing. And I think doing UI stuff, like having done, I did like a large part of the UI for, for Gauntlet. Sort of sitting with that and working with that and, and working with, you know, like how you reward people for clicking buttons or like, hey, you leveled up, awesome, queen. We didn't have leveling, so that doesn't work for Gauntlet. But like, just as a general concept of like rewarding people for doing well and for clicking buttons and opening stuff. And the Hearthstone example is like a good example of that. Like doing that stuff, just like rewarding people for playing the game, for throwing fireballs and that is is where I get a lot, a lot more of the, the enjoyment from rather than just like making something blow up. But it's all really good fun though. Actually, at the end of the day, whether you're, you get to make explosions, like, come on, that's awesome. So regardless if it's a real-world explosion or a fantasy explosion, it's still an explosion in there. Super awesome. Anybody else? You. How come you came to Sweden after Lionel? And what are your experience about the Swedish? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Um, the reason I actually moved to Sweden was that 
at Lionhead, I met a bunch of Swedish people. I was Swedish game developers, obviously. A couple of them worked at Lionhead with me. Um, one of them started the same day that I started. And we ended up kind of like drinking and partying, like Swedish people party all through summer and stuff like that. And it just became this thing where some of them, um, one of them worked with me on Fable 3. He moved back after that finished. Um, my other friend, she was on the, uh, the Milo project, Project Milo, which got sort of put on the side. So she moved back to Sweden as well. And it was a case where like everyone had sort of moved back and all the best friends that I'd made over the last little weird period of time all had moved back to Sweden. So I was like, uh, and I got into sort of more of a lead RFX artist position at Lionhead. And I was like, honestly started not really enjoying the direction that the games were going in and the, the sort of leadership kind of conflicted with what I thought should be going on. So after like two and a half years, I was like, no, my friends are in Sweden. I don't really enjoy this as much anymore. So I'm just going to hop over. And I really enjoy being here. Like, I really like it. And I, I got a bit jaded and a bit angry with England. So I'm kind of, I feel a lot, I feel a lot more at home, I think. Weirdly, I feel a lot more at home in Sweden than I do in England. So that's, I feel like I come home when I come back here. Whereas when I go back to England, I'm like, I don't really want to be here. Everything's like, <laughs> damp and brown. Everything's so damp in England, it's insane. <laughs> like, you go there in winter and the insulation is so bad and you're just like lying there and you're like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go to bed. And you just get into bed and you're like, the sheets are damp. <laughs> and then you put your head on the pillow and you sink into this like, oh, this like caress of just like cold moisture around your face and you're like, oh, it's nasty. So yeah, no, I don't think I can go back there. I don't think I could live back there again unless I had like Swedish grade insulation and stuff in whatever <laughs> building I lived in. So, um, yeah, I intend to stay here for quite a while. Definitely. Wow. Um, uh, where, where do you think are the uh, best resources for starting working on particle, particle effects? Like, where do you think are the best resources for working on particle effects, like in Maya and? for my case, Unreal Engine, and I would like to start, but I am, as you said, there are lack of resources. you have any good tips? There are, I mean, there's bits and pieces out there. I think having an interest in looking, actually learning quite a, or learning a bit about like how shaders work in terms of like code stuff, I think is a really good thing to actually spend some time doing. Understanding like the maths behind how shaders work instead of just plugging in those I think is really really valuable because then you can if you have that kind of insane crazy sort of creative mind You can go like okay Well, what if I use this weird bit of this with something else and the nice thing with unreal is you can just like plug everything and be like Okay, that did or didn't work and it's I'd say a lot of it is just like playing around with what's there just being kind of like like an infant with just the tools that you have and just, just plug things in in random places and type in random numbers and see what happens. And you kind of learn sort of through playing quite a bit. Um, always just keeping an eye out. And I, I hate, to, hate to recommend looking at other games because I think it's really, really bad for people working in games to only look at other games as reference. But some games are really, really good in terms of like effects stuff and what they're doing. And, and learning from that is really nice. And... I think it's just, it's more just like experience and playing with stuff, I would say, is, is kind of how I've learned a lot of the time. There's not been that much that I've actually found that I've learned from. It's just been like, okay, I need to make a smoke stack. All right, I'll get some footage of a smoke stack up and then be like, okay, well, I'll grab some of the footage and see how that works and just play with stuff. Uh, I don't feel that, hopefully it's changing, but I don't feel there's that much good stuff in terms of like tutorials and things around. Uh, at least for like for video game stuff, I think. Cool, thanks. Anybody else? No, sweet. Okay, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>